Well, welcome to another Friday night. We are in this reparenting series, and we're taking a little wee break, a little mini series within it, all around how to have a healthy relationship. What does that mean? What are the characteristics of a healthy relationship? And so tonight I want to look at the first one we're going to talk about, which to me is such a significant one, and is you can't have healthy intimacy. You can't have a healthy relationship unless both partners are committed to get the other partner. Unless they are growing in getting to know each other at a deep level. So I'm not talking about just superficial trivia about each other. I'm talking about knowing the depths of their soul. And that's a gradual process that takes years to get to. But the characteristic of a healthy relationship is you're working towards getting to know each other better at a deep level, to truly get them. Now this to me is so significant in the context of complex trauma. Because if you were to talk to almost every person with complex trauma, especially more severe complex trauma, the recurring thing you would hear is, I grew up in a family where nobody got me. I didn't feel my parents took the time to try to truly understand me. I never felt like anybody wanted to really understand how I thought, my dreams, my fears, my aspirations. I just never truly felt understood. That is such a sad, sad thing. But that, for many, is what caused them to then have complex trauma. Because what happens when a child feels nobody is taking the time to get to know me? They go, hmm, must be because I'm not good enough. Must be because something's wrong with me. Maybe I'm bad. And so now I feel shame. I feel everybody's going to reject me. And now my world is unsafe. It, it cre- so parents who don't take the time to get their children create a complex trauma environment for that children. And sadly, then most people coming out of complex trauma have never felt understood. But when it comes to reparenting ourselves or building relationships, getting a person, that doesn't happen unless you make it a priority in the relationship to get to know them. It doesn't happen unless you make it a priority to spend lots of time getting to know them, because it takes a lot of time. And a commitment to communicate, and to communicate about very scary topics, topics that make you feel vulnerable. And so getting a person is a great concept, but it doesn't just happen magically. It takes time, it takes commitment, it takes a priority, and it takes a lot of work. And it takes going through fear to get there. But more than that, you don't just get a person in a week and it's a one-time accomplishment and now I get you. No, it's an ongoing thing for the rest of your life. It's, it's something that you have to continue to put time and energy in for the rest of your life. Now, in the beginning, it might take even more time and energy because there's a lot to get to know, and you get to know them quite well, but even after you get to know them quite well, you still have to nurture that. You still have to take time to keep getting to know them because we change. We go through different experiences. And so it's an ongoing process that takes ongoing nurture and ongoing time and commitment. Let me take that further. Complex trauma, most people coming out of that base their sense of intimacy on feeling. I feel close to you. I feel connected to you. 
That is so misleading because true, healthy intimacy and connection is not based on feeling primarily. It's based on knowledge. It's based on getting the person, getting to know them at a deep, deep level and then accepting them. So if we're going to have healthy relationships, we have to get beyond just thinking it's about feeling. We have to get to understand it's about working and continuing to work and nurturing that work to get to know them and to know them at deeper and deeper and deeper levels. So, Dr. John Gottman in his book talks about this and he uses the term, this is creating love maps. And so what, for most people, a love map is, is this is a map of my partner. This is how they think. This is what they think. This is their beliefs, their values. This is their dreams. This is their fears. And you have a map. And it's all based on you love them, you want to know them, and now you're mapping out the inner territory of their life and their mind and their soul in order to really understand them. And so what I want to do today is give you super, super practical tools in how to get to know another person. Because the question I get asked all the time is, okay, I want to get to know my partner. All my relationships in the past have been based on just creating warm emotions. I'm afraid to get to know them. I don't have any tools for how to get to know them. So I want to give you a whole bunch of practical, practical tools and questions that you can use in your relationships to help you to start to get to know them. And you can use it with your children, your partner, friends. Now, if you're in an intimate relationship and you realize that getting to know a person is a long journey and it takes a lot of time in the beginning, but it still has to be nurtured over the years. What I would recommend is that you set up a date night where once a week, twice a week, you take time in that date night to ask each other questions that will help you get to know each other better at a deeper level. And so basically the rest of this talk is just going to be full of questions. So the first questionnaire that I'm going to give you, you can take it <clears throat> two ways. So the first way would be, it's going to give you a sense of how well you know your partner. So it's going to be a good report card on how well you get them. And it might be shocking to you to go, whoa, I don't get them very well. Or the second way you could use these questions is just questions that you could ask your partner in order to get to know them. So question one, I can name my partner's best friends. So you can use that as how well do you know your partners? And that means knowing their friends. Or you could, in the second way, say, I'm wanting to get to know you. Tell me who your best friends are. Okay, second question. I can tell you what stresses my partner is currently facing. Number three, I know the names of some of the people who have been irritating my partner lately. Number four, I can tell you some of my partner's life dreams. Five, I am very familiar with my partner's religious beliefs and ideas. Six, I can tell you about my partner's basic philosophy of life. So I hope you see these are going to deep stuff. Their friends, their dreams, their aspirations, their religious beliefs, their morals and values, their philosophy of life. Number seven, I can list the relatives my partner likes the least. Number eight, I know my partner's favorite music. Nine, I can list my partner's three favorite movies. Ten, 
my partner is familiar with my current stresses. So now you're kind of flipping it back. How well do you think your partner knows you? Number 11, I know the three most special times in my partner's life. 12, I can tell you the most stressful thing that happened to my partner as a child. 13, I can list my partner's major aspirations and hopes in life. 14, I know my partner's major current worries. 15, my partner knows who my friends are. Now, some of you might want to take screenshots of these and then be able to come back to them later and ask them with your partner or friend. 16, I know what my partner would want to do if they won the lottery. 17, I can tell you in detail my first impressions of my partner. 18, periodically I ask my partner about their world right now. 19, I feel that my partner knows me pretty well. And 20, my partner is familiar with my hopes and aspirations. So you give yourself one for each true answer. And if you have over 10, then you're fairly positive that you get your partner fairly well. If it's under 10, then it's saying that you don't know your partner super well. And so there's some work to be done. Okay, let me take you to a second questionnaire. And so again, you can do this um, in two ways. Number one, you can do it with your partner as a way to quiz each other but not in a judgmental way, not in a way to get mad at them, but just in a way to say, how well do you know me? Or you can do it in the way of saying, here's a question I want to ask you about your life. So the first one is, name my two closest friends. Or you could say, who are your two closest friends? So that's how you can use this second questionnaire. Number two, what is my favorite musical group, composer, or instrument? Number three, what was I wearing when we first met? Now, I, I want to just comment on this because if you were to ask me what my wife was wearing when we were first met, I wouldn't have a clue. But that's partly because when I meet people, I don't tend to notice a lot of ex external stuff about them. My, my brain goes to first impressions of their soul. And so it's a good question to ask just to have a conversation. Do you know what I was wearing when we first met? But we're going to get to kind of the deeper question that for some is more important. What were my first impressions of you when we first met? Okay, number four, name one of my hobbies. Five, where was I born? Six, what stresses am I facing right now? Seven, this one's really important. Describe in detail what I did today or yesterday. In other words, how well do you pay attention to what I do every day? Eight, when is my birthday? Nine, what is the date of our anniversary? Ten, who is my favorite relative? Eleven, what is my fondest unrealized dream? Well, what is my favorite website? 13. What is one of my greatest fears or disaster scenarios? 14. What is my favorite time of day for lovemaking? 15. What turns me on sexually? 16. What makes me feel most competent? When am I most in the zone? When am I most confident? because I feel confident. 17, what is my favorite meal or food? 18, what is my favorite way to spend an evening? 19, what is my favorite color? 20, what kind of present do I like best? 21, what personal improvements do I want to make in my life? 22, what was one of my best childhood experiences? 23, 
What was my favorite vacation? 24. What is one of my favorite ways to relax? 25. Who is my greatest source of support other than you? 26. What is my favorite sport? 27. What do I most like to do with time off? 28. What is one of my favorite weekend activities? 29. What is my dream getaway place? 30. What is my favorite movie? 31. What are some of the most important events coming up in my life, and how do I feel about them? 32. What are some of my favorite ways to work out? 33. Who was my best friend in childhood? 34. What is my favorite magazine, or you could put my favorite app? 35. Name one of my major enemies. 36. What would I consider my ideal job? 37. What do I fear the most? 38. Who is my least favorite relative? 39. What is my favorite holiday? 40. What kind of books do I most like to read? 41. What is my favorite TV show? 42. Which side of the bed do I prefer? 43. What am I most sad about? 44. Name one of my concerns or worries. 45. What medical problems do I worry about? 46. What was, the most, what was my most embarrassing moment? 47. What was my worst childhood experience? 48. Name two of the people I most admire. 49. Name my major rival or enemy. 50. Of all the people we both know, who do I like the least? 51. What is one of my favorite desserts? 52. What's my social security number? 53. Name one of my favorite novels. 54. What's my favorite restaurant? 55. What are two of my aspirations, hopes, or wishes? 56. Do I have a secret ambition? What is it? 57. What foods do I hate? 58. What's my favorite animal? 59. What's my favorite song? And 60. What am I most passionate about? So again, you can see there's just questions that you can take one or two of those a week or every couple days, ask, and they can lead to some great discussions, great discovery about each other. They can go really deep. And it's a way to gradually get to know another person. Now, there's a third questionnaire, and it's another type of way of asking questions, and it's called open-ended questions. So let me give you some open-ended questions that you can then use. Number one, how would you like to be different three years from now? So what would you like to change as far as your growth, job, living location, all of those things. What, number two, do you see your work changing in the future? If so, how? Number three, what is your opinion of our physical home? Would you make changes if you could? That can be a huge discussion. Number four, how do you think your life would be different if you lived 100 years ago? That might not lead to any huge dogmatic type answers, but it can lead to some really interesting discussions. Number five, how would you compare yourself as a mother or father to your own mother or father? Six, what kind of person do you think our children will become? Any fears you have for each child? Any hopes you have for each child? Such an important question to talk about. Number seven, how are you feeling about your job these days? Number eight, if you could redo a five-year period of your life, 
Which would you choose? And why? Number nine. How are you feeling right now about being a parent? Ten. If you could change one thing in your past, what would it be? Number 11. What is the most exciting thing happening in your life right now? 12. If you could instantly possess three new skills, which would you choose? Again, these are just questions that you can use or not use, but they just potentially can help you get to know somebody else better. Number 13. When it comes to the future, what do you worry about the most? Number 14. Who do you consider your best friends or allies? Has the list changed recently? 15. What qualities do you value most highly in your friends right now? 16. What were the best and worst things that happened to you when you were a teenager? 17. If you could live during any other time in history, when would you choose and why? 18. If you could choose a different career, what would it be and why? 19. What is the one thing you would most like to change about your personality and why? 20. Do you feel like certain things are missing from your life? What are they? 21. Do you think you've changed in the past year? How so? 22. If you could design the perfect home for us, what would it be like? 23. If you could live another person's life, whose would you choose? 24. Have any of your life goals recently changed? 25. What are some of your life dreams now? 26. What are your goals for us as a family or a couple? 27. What goals do you have just for yourself right now? 28. If you could change one thing about yourself right now, what would it be? 29. What have been the highlights and low points for the past year for you? 30. What adventures would you like to have in your life right now? So again, wonderful questions. When Kim, my wife, and I were dating, we went through a whole bunch of these questions as part of our dates. And then after we got married, we said, you know what, let's continue to have a date night. And we do, still. 37 years later, we have a date night every week. And still, we regularly try to ask each other questions that enable us to continue to have conversations, discussions that keep us getting to know each other better. Such an important part of our relationship. Okay, another questionnaire. Who am I? So, what has happened in my life, number one, that, has, that I am extremely proud of? What are my psychological triumphs that have exceeded my expectations when I came through periods of trials and tribulations even better off? So explore those triumphs. Number two, how have these successes shaped your life? How have they affected the way you think about yourself? How have they influenced your goals and the things that you strive for? Number three, what role has validation played in your life? Feeling proud, being praised, expressing praise for others. Did your parents show you that they were proud of you as a child? How? How have other people responded to your accomplishments? So a huge discussion and questions around just the topic of validation. Number four, did your parents show that they loved you? How? Was affection readily expressed in your family? If not, what are the effects and implications of this for your current relationships? So explore love and affection in your family of origin and how it's affected you today. Number five, did you ever escape into a fantasy world as a child? If so, what was it like? 
Number six, did you feel seen and accepted by your parents? If not, what is it they didn't accept about you? Number seven, what role do your own strivings and accomplishments have in our, your relationship? What do you want your partner to know and understand about these aspects of yourself, your strivings and accomplishments? How do you show pride in each other in your relationship? Number eight, what difficult injuries or periods have you gone through? Now let me just stop and say this. Some people like to take these questions in this Who Am I section and just ask themselves personally first and journal about it and have their partner go through the same thing on their own, journal about it, and then come together and talk about it. So number eight, what difficult injuries or periods have you gone through? Your losses, hurts, traumas, disappointments, trials. Include periods of stress and duress, as well as quieter periods of despair, depression, loneliness. Number nine, how have you survived these traumas? So what things helped you survive, but what are their lasting effects on you? Ten, how did you strengthen and heal yourself? Eleven, how did you protect yourself from this ever happening again? Twelve, how do these injuries and the ways you protect and heal yourself affect your relationship today? What do you want your partner to understand about these aspects of yourself? So what we're seeing is you can't get each other, you can't get your partner, and have them get you unless you get you. And so these questions are designed as an inventory of a way of deepening your own self-awareness, of thinking deeply about your life and why you are the way you are then you can share that with your partner. So your partner getting you begins with you first getting yourself. Then you can reveal to them important stuff. Number 13, what role did humor have in your family and in your life? And what role does it have today? 14, how did your family express the following when you were a child? How did they express anger? Sadness, fear, affection, interest in one another, pride in one another. Fifteen, were there any topics you weren't allowed to talk about as a child that were off limits? Sixteen, during your childhood, did your family have to cope with a severe emotional problem like an ang angry parent, parental conflict, mental illness? What implications does this have for your relationships today, including relationships with your children, your parents, and your siblings? 17. What is your own philosophy about expressing feelings, particularly sadness, anger, fear, pride, and love? Are any of these difficult for you to express or to hear your partner express? Number 18. What differences exist between you and your partner in the area of expressing emotions? What is behind these differences? And what are the implications of these differences for you? 19. Imagine you are in a cemetery looking at your tombstone. Now write the epitaph you would like to see there. Number 20, write your own obituary. How do you want people to remember you to think of your life? 21, write a mission statement for your life. What is the purpose of your life? What is its meaning? What are you trying to accomplish? What is your larger struggle bigger than just the day-by-day -day stuff? 22, what legacy would you like to leave when you die? 23, what significant goals have you yet to realize? 24. Describe the person you want to become. 25. How can your, you best help yourself 
become that person. 26. What struggles have you already faced in trying to become that person? 27. What demons in yourself have you had to fight or still have to fight? So, what's your dark side? 28. What would you most like to change about yourself? 29. What dreams have you denied yourself or failed to develop and why? 30. What do you want your life to be like in five years? 31. What is the story of the kind of person you would like to be? So, as I said, I just wanted this session to be full of questions, practical, practical stuff. Questions you can then say, oh yeah, I could ask that to my partner, and that would help, help me get to know that them better. Or I need to ask that to myself and figure myself out and, and grow in self-awareness so that I can then share that with my partner. So again, I've given you a couple hundred questions here. And you could take, if even if you did a couple a week, that's a couple years of questions that you have now to ask and explore and keep getting to know each other. And because we change, those are going to, you can ask them again in a couple years and you might get slightly different answers because you've changed. So I just hope this has given you some really practical stuff that you can then take and use, and you can even use in asking your children and getting to know them so they feel seen and understood. Well, that's the end of part one. Hopefully, again, helpful stuff for you. You can take a short break, come back for the spiritual part. If that doesn't interest you, again, no offense taken. We get it. Um, you're free to go. See you next week. Everybody else will be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. I, I want to start a new series in this spiritual section today on spiritual bypassing. So a number of weeks ago, I did a talk in the reparenting series on helping your children figure out the spiritual part of life, spirituality. And part of what I did in that talk was talk about the danger with spirituality is that People abuse it. And there's all kinds of different ways spirituality gets abused. And one of the ways is what we call spiritual bypassing. And basically it means you try to use the spiritual to bypass having to do something hard. So you're looking for a magic fix, a quick fix, a shortcut, an easier path. That's spiritual bypassing. So it tends to be that you're avoiding one of three things. Number one, you are avoiding hard work. So <clears throat> you're thinking, I don't want to have to do all this hard work to grow, to change. There's got to be an easier way. There's got to be a quick fix. And so you look for the spiritual to be a magic solution, a quick way so you don't have to work hard at growth. That would be an abuse of spirituality, spiritual bypassing. Or I don't want to sit in painful emotion. Maybe in the spiritual, I can find a magic quick fix that takes me immediately out of painful emotions to positive emotions. That's spiritual bypassing. Or this growth process is so slow and so messy. Isn't there a way to make it quick? to make it short, to make it just step one, two, three, and you're all better. Maybe the spiritual provide that quick growth, quick fix, so it's not a slow, messy process. That's spiritual bypassing. So let me give you a definition that I came across that I thought was well-written. Spiritual bypassing is a very persistent shadow of spirituality manifesting in many forms, often without being acknowledged as such. It means employing spiritual beliefs to avoid 
dealing in any significant depth with our pain and development needs. Aspects of spiritual bypassing include exaggerated detachment from something, emotional numbing and repression, overemphasis on the positive, anger phobia or avoidance of anger as seeing, or seeing anger as all bad, blind or overly tolerant compassion, so not setting boundaries, weak or too porous boundaries, lopsided development. In other words, cognitive intelligence often being far ahead of emotional or moral intelligence. Debilitating judgment about one's negativity or shadow side. So just judging anytime you're tempted, anytime you struggle, your dark side, seeing it only negatively. Devaluing of the personal relative to the spiritual. So all that's important is spiritual. All the other parts of life don't matter as much. Or delusions of having arrived at a higher level of being. Wow, that is, says it so thoroughly, completely, and very well. So here's what I want you to understand. And I've said before that when I started in this field, the lady that mentored me, a godly, spiritual woman, said, sometimes your worst clients are those that are spiritual. And the reason is, because if they get into spiritual bypassing, they think they don't have to work hard at recovery. It'll just magically happen. And so in the Bible, there's some verses that are so important to understand. Colossians 1.29 says, Paul says this, That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. In other words, what he is saying is this. We have God's power and our responsibility and our power. The danger in spiritual bypassing is, oh, I'll just trust God's power and then I don't have to do anything. No, Paul says, I trust God's power, but I have to do work hard. So it's 100% God, but 100% me. So being spiritual doesn't mean it's 100% God and I just sit around and God does everything for me. Paul says, no, we bring it into balance. I still got to work just as hard as everybody, even harder. It's 100% me, but I trust God. That's the right way to approach life. No spiritual bypassing. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, he says this, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. Well, who gets the prize? Well, all athlete, athletes are disciplined in tr their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. We are disciplined in our training because we're going to get a prize that doesn't fade away, an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I discipline my body like an athlete training it to do what it should. In other words, this life is training, discipline, hard work. It's like an athlete preparing for the Olympics. It's not sitting around saying, oh, God's going to just do it for me. It's I got to get up every morning. I got to go through this routine. I got to do this hard work. I got to push myself. That's what Scripture teaches is the Christian life. And if you look through all of the Bible, and we've just gone through the Psalms, you realize people struggle. You realize that people worked hard to the point of exhaustion. So what I want to do in this series is, is give you kind of that big picture that true spirituality is hard work. There's no bypasses. But I want to take some of the verses that are misused and just talk about them and help you understand them in a way that will prevent them from being misused ever again in your life. So the first one I want to talk about is Isaiah 40, 31. It says, Even youths will become weak and tired. Young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high 
on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. I remember listening to a Hebrew scholar who had been a Hebrew scholar all of his adult life, and he was now near the end of his life. And he talked about this verse, and it just made, it all makes sense to me. He said, in the West, we have to understand that when you get three things piled up, so soar like an eagle, run and not grow weary, walk and not faint, three things. He said, how we approach that in literature in the West is different from how it's approached in the East. So in the West, in our English language, we would go, he's talking about going from the greatest to the least. So if you trust God, wait on the Lord, trust the Lord, you're going to soar like an eagle. That's the greatest. That's the greatest expression of faith. And if you have really good faith, that should become your norm. You just soar like an eagle all the time and it's just wow life then if your faith isn't quite there yet then you're going to run and not grow weary you're going to be able to run marathons and, and you just won't grow weary and there's still a wow that that's great it's not soaring but it's still really really great i wish i could do that and then if your faith isn't that great you're gonna just be able to walk and you're going to be able to walk without growing faint. So that's how faith will work. And he says, you know what? That is the exact opposite of how the Hebrew mind would read that. And that's what I want you to realize. You see, in the English, we go from soaring is the greatest and should be the normal if you have good faith to walking and not growing weary that's kind of the low level of faith and it should be the exception flip it then you have the hebrew mind the normal is walking the exception is the odd time you might soar the odd time you might run and not grow weary but that's rarely going to happen most of the time the normal in life, which even is going to be the normal for those with the greatest faith, is you're going to walk on the edge of fainting. You are going to feel great weariness. You are going to just basically get through a day putting one foot in front of another, pushing yourself to take one more step. That a person who does that day after day, even though they're weary, that is the greatest spiritual person. Wow, we would say that's the poorest spiritual person. If you're spiritual, you should be soaring. No, no. If you're super spiritual, you're going to applaud. You're going to be faithful to keep working, walking, even when you're exhausted. Trusting that God will somehow give you the strength to take that next step. Oh, I love that. I have found that to be true in my life. I just wish we could get rid of this spiritual bypassing that makes a faith person, a person of great faith, a person of great spirituality, make it look like they just soar all the time and life is easy for them. The Bible actually says the opposite. You look at all the great saints of the Bible and you begin to see people that life was super hard. Life at times was just walking on the edge of exhaustion, putting one foot in front of another, trusting that God had somehow give them the strength to take the next step, but feeling like God wasn't there, feeling it was all on them. And then not seeing God's strength until years later and they look back in hindsight and go, yes, God got me through that. I don't know how, because I ran out of my own strength, but somehow God poured in some extra strength. That's the normal. That's the greatest expression of faith and spirituality. 
Isaiah 40, 31. Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping us see what you intended this verse to say and to realize that when we're working hard and struggling and exhausting and it's that that's okay that's actually could be a sign of great spirituality and faith doesn't mean we're failing in any way doesn't mean you're not there for us we just don't often feel it and i just pray you'd help each person to be encouraged by this to readjust to what true spirituality looks like amen well, that's the end of another Friday night. Thank you so much for being here. Hopefully it was helpful.